What's up, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls? Jesse Warden here. Today we're going to talk about providing a public API to JavaScript developers from Rescript. And there's a lot of interesting challenges in doing that. And we're going to cover the aspects, some strategies you can fix that today. Namely, around using a single configuration object to inspect it and solve a lot of problems that JavaScript developers have. And in turn, it allows us to inspect it with strong types in Rescript, so we still retain our strong typing abilities, but can speak in a language that JavaScript developers buy, returning exceptions to them in a promise. Jesse Warden. You've developed a Rescript library, and the reason you like Rescript over TypeScript is that you don't have null pointers, you don't have runtime errors, and you just feel really happy with what you've done. So you go to compile it, and it compiles pretty quick, you feel good. So you're like, all right, cool. So it's got a JavaScript conversion of this. So demo RS will compile to demo.bs.js. And so that's what the JavaScript developers consume. So you hand it to the JavaScript developer and they go, cool. So they go to test it using their sandbox and already they have a problem. Now errors, runtime errors are okay in a promise perspective because that's the interface of the promise, right? Is that it'll either resolve with a value or it'll resolve with an error. The issue is that this particular error isn't yours. This is something to do with node fetch, which means they foobarred a URL somehow. And it doesn't really make any sense because you've tested this with property tests and you're a little confused how this could possibly happen. So all bets are off. Suddenly you're getting errors that you're not expecting and that's really frustrating because the whole point of using Rescript is that, you know, those problems grow away, right? But again, JavaScript's going Rescript. So JavaScript has no types, has no enforcement of order of parameters and all this other stuff. So you're a little frustrated. So you say what you would say to any coder that has problems with code you gave me. He's like, just show me your code. So you open up their code and take a look and immediately you can see three problems. The first is that their ID is first and the password is second. You can tell because most IDs are numbers and passwords are like, you know, some text. And they're in the wrong order. It's supposed to be password first. So if you go audit and look at the code hint, password first, ID second, host third. So that's problem number one. Problem number two is that the types are wrong, which further confuses things. Maybe, right? Is that this is an integer first instead of a string, and this is a string instead of an integer second. So you may get some weird problems, or the worst, no problems, such as concat or length, because string and numbers can both do those kind of things. So it's problematic. And then the last third problem, and this is a problem indicative of JavaScript, Things like Python and Lua, Python especially, get really mad about functionality. If you have a function with three parameters and you only pass two, Python gets mad at you. And same with a function with three parameters and you pass four. Again, it throws an error. JavaScript doesn't. Sometimes it'll even work. And sometimes it'll imply undefined for you, which is not often what you meant to do, right? So there's a lot of problems with using parameters in JavaScript. It might not have been intentional, right? And that's okay. JavaScript developers don't have a compiler. They don't have the runtime function area, and they don't have any runtime ty type assertions around that kind of stuff. It's not really good. One thing JavaScript developers have done to mitigate this is they, they get around too many parameters, and they create what's called a config object. Now, there's no agreement on what too many parameters are. Is it some will say two, right? Some will say eight, some will say 15. There's no real consensus, but they all agree is that this should be a single parameter, which is a object, right? A JavaScript object that has key value pairs for your parameters. So instead of this, they go ID, password, and then they notice they're missing host. So they go host. Now they can't screw up order because any order that you put the key value pairs doesn't matter whether you put ID or password first. They're all in the same object and they all have an ID that equals this, a password equals this. So order suddenly goes away. Type order goes away because the ID is an integer. The password is a string. Host is a string, right? So that goes away. And then lastly, there's no parameter order problems from a number perspective because there's only ever one. So even if they screw this up, right, they pull it from some dynamic configuration, for example, or they misspell a variable name, JavaScript's gonna imply undefined anyway as a single parameter because of JavaScript, right? So it solves a lot of problems doing this. This is kind of why JavaScript developers have kind of adopted this. But this has a lot of advantages for the Rescript developer because these objects and these individual properties can be type checked using the Rescript JavaScript types. Now you can't really depend on JavaScript, right? JavaScript's still throwing you stuff that you can't have a type for this, but you can rely on 
rescripts types to assert on these kind of things at compile time, which is amazing. So let's go check that out. We'll keep this now and we'll go and rescript and we'll show you the how to support this kind of public API. So the first thing is we need to acknowledge your rescript code is good, right? Functions that take inputs and have outputs are fantastic. The compiler will help you with this stuff, right? Now, yes, a lot of strongly typed programmers who are functional look at things like this and go, all right, using a string, that means it's untyped, <laughs> right? So strings and booleans are, are kind of not really good from a typing perspective, but let's go with it, okay? So one thing we can do is make this private. We're gonna put a, an underscore in front of it. Now, that's just a convention. It doesn't actually do anything magic, but it implies that this is for us and that this is for the JavaScript developers, okay? So this is a very common convention is they provide a config object. So let's verify they first sent us a config object. And the way we do that is we switch on it based on using the nullable to option. So nullable, nullable to option is kind of neat because it'll take a null or undefined and make it a nothing. And so we can confirm either one of those is not gonna work, right? And so we can reject on that. We'll do a promise reject and speak in the language of JavaScript developers. Your config does not exist. So we make a statement that it doesn't exist. They might have thought they sent something, but it's undefined or null. It's one of the two, which means for all intents and purposes, it doesn't exist. Now we tell them what to do to remediate that problem. So they got an error, fine. But here's how they fix the error. That's what a lot of errors don't do is that they miss that second part. So we're going to help them. You need to provide an object, but we go a step further and give them an example, right, of what that is. So we show the entire configuration needed. Now, they might have already done this. They might have misspelled a variable name, whatever, but at least we confirm what they were thinking. So that also helps to build and kind of quash the insecurity, right? So good error helps them out and it follows the same promise mentality. So we speak in a language that JavaScript developers you know, want, right? Because here's how they work. They code some stuff and they go, load sandbox. It doesn't work. And they go, oh, auto is not a function. Oh, and they write some code and they go, oh, no, no. This fast feedback loop of writing code, fixing, modifying, and running is what all dynamic developers love, is that you can quickly get this amazing feedback loop. So to work with that feedback loop, to encourage it, to speak their language, we need to provide errors that tell them how to remediate it. Now, just because they don't have errors, obviously doesn't mean their code now doesn't work, but that, that helps JavaScript developers you know, move forward, right? So now that we have the none state handle where they forgot or they messed it up. Now we actually have something. So we're going to use this options here, okay? So we don't have to worry about shadowing, right? Config and options. And now that we have the options, we're going to do some very imperative style coding here. You don't have to do it imperative, but we're going to do it because it's, it's just a little easier to go line by line to make sure that each one of these kind of checks have been in play. And the way we do that is we get the items from the options. Now, normally in Rescript, you can go like dynamic data, right? And go like this. The problem is you don't know what this is. It could be an undefined, it could be a string, it could be another object, who knows, right? So we, what we wanna do is convert it to maybe it's a piece of data or not. And again, the same way you do that here is nullable to options. So again, if data's there or not, maybe it's there, maybe it's not, we use that type that's built into Rescript that embraces JavaScript, right? Because it's part of the JS, right, module path. So now we have, it's maybe either nothing or something. And so we're gonna do the same thing with the other two. Instead of unsafely accessing these objects, we now do it in a very typed way. And this is step one of removing most all null pointers. And that's embracing the concept of a maybe, or in this case, in Rescript, it's an option. It's either nothing or something. And so you have to handle both scenarios. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's, let's verify. We'll say if option is none for ID maybe. Well, let's handle that scenario. If it's not there, then we need to let them know that it's not there. So yes, you did send a configuration object, but it's missing a key piece of data and that's the ID. Reject it. We'll say your ID is not defined on your configuration object. So we're already implying that they have a configuration object, right? But it's not there. And let them know it's supposed to be an integer of your ID. So you know what your ID is, make sure it's an integer, not a string, and make sure it's called ID and put it on the configuration object. So basic error of what went wrong and what they need to do to fix it. So we're gonna do the exact same thing with the other two. If it's a nothing, right, it's an undefined or null or just missing, maybe it's there but you misspelled it, maybe it's IDs, right? Very common mistake.
And now we have two more. So we've verified if the password isn't there, it's not defined. It's supposed to be a non-empty string. And host, if the host is not defined, it's supposed to be a non-empty string. And we went a step further. We said such as server.com. Because when some people think host, they think server.com, right? They don't think of a URL because we didn't call it URL, we called it host. So there could be some ambiguity there. So we went, you know, over communicated, right? Let them know. Now, sadly, JavaScript puts the errors at the top, right? Not at the bottom. Python will put this kind of stuff, like here's the error. It'll put it at the very bottom. So the last thing you see is there. So we're just going to have faith that the JavaScript developer <laughs> scrolls up and sees that. But we want this very descriptive, very helpful, and to jump out at them and make them feel comfortable that they know how to fix it, right? So now that we verified that each one is not a none, we can start handling the fact that, oh, okay, well, the value is there, so we can use those values. So we can safely access those values without worry. So notice here, I'm going password maybe, and I'm getting it, and it's if it's not there, it's gonna throw an exception. We don't have to worry about it because right up here we confirmed it's not a none, right? So we can safely do these kind of unsafe operations because our types keep us in track, but also we've kind of broken out to do some imperative style coding here. So let's do that for all three. Snag out the actual item. And now we've actually got a good public API. Now, you don't have to stop here. Some people can say, oh, well, the host is missing HTTP or the password is not the current length. Maybe you do that here. Maybe you let your other functions make the assumption. That's really up to you if you want to you know, follow the promise mentality of like all errors go through that single monad. That's fine. But sometimes it's helpful here. It's really up to your call. The point is, at least if you're looking for data validation, sometimes it's nice to have it all in one place but maybe you want to do it on a per function basis. That's fine too. The point is that we're speaking the exception language of JavaScript developers and equipping them to succeed in a public API while retaining our nice strongly API, strongly type one for us, right? So now that we save this and we call our internal one, all these are speaking the same return value of a promise with that API. So let's retry now that our JavaScript is using the correct configuration output. Let's run it again now that we have a public API for them. So we run it, and voila, we have our token back. Fantastic. If an HTTP error happened, they would still get the normal HTTP error from node fetch, and that would imply some kind of network error that's not on us. You can't strongly type the lack of internet away, but at least you can confirm that it comes from that promise-based interface in the form of an error, which is fantastic. That'll mitigate all those problems. It'll speak in a language they understand. Now, there's one extra thing you can do, and that is speak in an overly verbose language. A lot of dynamic developers will sometimes kind of include types in the property names. Some people love it. Some people hate it. They're like, you're deviating from the whole point of dynamic languages, right? That quick, you know, change the code and run, change the code and run, right? Other people say, well, it helps in some cases. For example, if this is a host, why are we including this? Maybe this should be URL. So that's one where you can just simply using the right word can make a world of difference of making sure the JavaScript developer gives you the right type, right? So you're already dealing with danger because it's a string. Sometimes even that property name helps. But another thing you can do is say ID number instead of ID string. Because IDs, it's very unclear if they're strings, numbers, right? No one really knows. If you have four zeros in front, that kind of implies a string, but maybe they do it for you, who knows, right? So something like ID string kind of implies, all right, it's supposed to be a type or ID number. So that's that's one thing you can do. And then sometimes the rules of the actual type, so such as password seven min 255 max. So suddenly you've encoded the rules or range of the value in the type itself. So it's gotta be a minimum of seven characters, 255. So that's another thing you can do. And this will motivate the JavaScript developer to check their own data sometimes and kind of put the you know, onus on them. So there's nothing wrong with double checks of JavaScript developers testing their data and then you know, obviously you with your types. So some people hate it, some people don't like it. It's just you know, another option to increase that communication. We've shown you how you can take a public API to remove order of operations. There's no longer a problem. It's only one parameter. Second, the types don't matter because ID will have this type and password will have this type. So you don't have to worry about an integer first and a string second when it was supposed to be reversed. And lastly, because JavaScript doesn't have arity enforcement, right? How many parameters your function takes. If you just do one, you never have a problem because even if you forget it, it's an implied undefined, right? So you have that away. 
So this solves a lot of problems using this configuration thing for JavaScript developers. That way in Rescript, you can then inspect each one of those properties individually and run either just a simple rule to make sure it's you know actual value or even further validation such as password length, host shape, things like that. And this allows you to leverage all the wonderful strong types that Rescript provides for you for JavaScript, right? Very, very fantastic. But you can still speak in the language of JavaScript developers, and that's errors. In this case, runtime exceptions, but only in a promise mechanism, right? If it was synchronous, that's fine. You can raise an error, but you're speaking the language they do, and you only do it from the public method exposed specifically for the JavaScript developers. So while you might have your internal one for you with all your wonderful types, this one audit is exposed so the JavaScript developer can call it that way. Very, very similar to AWS Lambda, if you've seen where you have all the dangerous stuff like exceptions and stuff are spoken you know, mainly in the main function. Hopefully that gives you some better ideas on how to expose libraries that are strongly typed with Rescript. So you get all the value of Rescript, right? No runtime null pointer exceptions, no errors strong type, super fast compiler, but you still expose it to JavaScript developers and then they can use it in ways that they feel comfortable and you equip them with errors that helps them you know, set up to succeed. So again, if you got any other questions, hit me up in the comments or Twitter. My name is Jesse Warden, more than happy to help. And I hope this was useful and gives you some better ideas for maybe even JavaScript too, if you're using you know, Joy or Folktale to do this kind of stuff at runtime in JavaScript, for example. Thanks for your time.